on 23rd of July 2024, Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman presented the union budget for the financial year 2024-2025. Now, this is her seventh consecutive budget presentation and the first budget presentation of the new government which was formulated after the general elections of 2024. Hence, it becomes even more important because this budget will lay the outline for the workings of the government for the next five years and will also show the path to the government for the next consecutive four budgets, which is why this budget becomes very, very important for us to understand. Now, Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi has praised this budget and said that this budget is for all sections of the society and will help India in becoming a Vixit Bharat by the year 2047. So, will help in developed India by 2047, when India completes 100 years of its independence. However, former Finance Minister P. Chitamram, while highlighting the criticisms of the budget, said that this budget fails to assure to the people of India that how inflation would be controlled in the country. And he also highlighted the concerns in relation to unemployment situation in our country and said that this budget gives too little for improving the condition of unemployment. Now, as always, many quarters have praised this budget for different aspects and several other quarters have criticized this budget, highlighting some missed opportunities and lack of importance given to certain sectors. So what the budget of 2024 is all about? What are the changes, highlights and initiatives introduced in the budget? What are the positives and negatives of the budget and all the other analytical aspects which we need to know in relation to the budget we'll be trying to understand in this particular session. Hello, my name is Preetpal Singh and today we would be analysing the budget of 2024. Now let's start from the very basics and let us try to understand that what does this term government budget means. So, budget is a forecast of the government's expenditure and revenue for the coming next year. The first budget of pre-independent India was presented in the year 1816 by the person named as James Wilson of the British Indian government. Now, after independence, India's first budget was presented in 1947 by the then finance minister R.K. Shanmukham Chetty. Union budget is presented every year on 1st of February by the finance minister in Lok Sabha. However, the union budget for 2024-2025 was presented on 23rd of July 2024. The reason is that interim budget was presented in February 2024. And why this was the case? Because this year was the year of general elections. Now, as per Article 112, the President shall, in respect of every financial year, causes to be laid before both the Houses of the Parliament a statement of the estimated receipts and expenditure of the Government of India for the year. In that part, it is referred to as annual financial statement. So, budget is known as annual financial statement as per the Article 112 of Indian Constitution. So, interesting thing to note here is that the term budget does not find any mention in the Constitution of India. And what is mentioned in the Constitution of India? The annual financial statement. Now, theoretically speaking, if we have to understand the classification of a budget, budget is classified under two categories. One is the revenue budget, another is the capital budget. Now, the revenue budget deals with the regular receipts and the regular expenditure of the government. And the capital budget, it deals with basically the assets and liabilities and changes in the assets and liabilities in relation to the government. We'll understand how it is the case. If we see the revenue budget, it is divided again under two categories. One is revenue receipts, another is revenue expenditure. Now, revenue receipts involves the incomes or the receipts of the government in relation to its ordinary course of governance. So, these receipts does not create any liability and does not lead to reduction of any assets of the government of India. And they are in turn classified into tax and non-tax receipts. And on the other hand, revenue expenditure is the expenditure incurred by the government of India in its day-to-day -day functioning, in its regular day-to-day -day functioning. Now, this expenditure does not lead to creation of any asset and does not lead to reduction of any liability. And this is what the revenue budget entails. The other part of the budget is the capital budget. And capital budget again is classified under two heads. One is the capital receipts and one is capital expenditure. Now, capital receipts are the receipts which creates any form of liability for the government or leads to reduction of any assets of the government. So, for example, loans, they create liability for the government, so are capital receipts. Or, for example, disinvestment, they lead to reduction of assets for the government and that is why they are part of capital receipts. Another part is capital expenditure. Now, any expenditure which leads to creation of any asset or reduction of any liability of the government of India is what we call as capital expenditure. For example, repayment of loans. It leads to reduction of liability for the government and hence it is a capital expenditure. Or creation or money spent on building roads, building railways. It leads to creation of assets for the government of India and hence again it is a capital expenditure. So again, this is what the capital part of the budget entails. 
and there is a budget division under the Department of Economic Affairs which is really having the task of preparation of the union budget. Now, budget is presented by the union finance minister consisting of two parts, part A and part B. So basically part A is the macroeconomic part of the budget where new schemes and priorities of the government are announced and allocation to different sectors are made. Part B deals with the finance bill which basically contains taxation proposal and how the government would be taxing the public of India or the people of India in relation to income tax, that is direct taxes and indirect taxes. Now major budget documents, apart from the finance minister's budget speech, which are presented to the parliament are the annual financial statement under the article 112, demand for grants under article 113, finance bill under article 110 and fiscal policy statements, which are mentioned under the FRBM Act of 2003, that is fiscal response responsibility and budget management act of 2003 now under that there are two basic statements first is the macroeconomic framework statement and another is the medium term fiscal policy come fiscal policy strategy statement a very interesting thing to note here is that before the year 2016, there were two separate budgets which were presented in the parliament. One was the general budget and another was the railway budget. And this practice for a separate railway budget was started in the year 1924 and was done on the recommendation of Ackworth's committee. However, in 2016, a committee composed of Bibek de Broy and Kishore Desai suggested and recommended that this exercise should be scrapped. So on 21st of September 2016, the railway budget was merged with the general budget. And from 2017 onwards, only single budget, that is the general budget, was presented before the Parliament of India. Now, if we have to understand, the entire process of budgeting in our country, it can broadly be divided under five different steps. First step is when the budget is presented in the Lok Sabha. Second is the general discussion on the budget in both of the houses. Third is when the standing committees, they scrutinizes individual ministries' demand for grants. The fourth step is the detailed discussion and the voting on demand for grants in the Lok Sabha. And last stage is the appropriation and the finance bill passing. So it is the stage where the appropriation bill and the finance bill is passed by the Parliament of India and budget is deemed to be passed by the country. So the printing of the budget basically starts one week before the presentation of the budget in the Parliament. And it starts with the halwa ceremony, where halwa is prepared in large quantities and is served to the officials and the support staff which were involved in making the budget. Now this halwa ceremony also starts the lock-in period for the finance ministry staff, where they cannot come in contact with the outside world. Now earlier, this lock-in period lasted for long. It lasted for two weeks or three weeks. Now it just lasts for one week because of the digital presentation of the budget and the requirement of the budget not to be printed more. On 1st of February 2021, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman presented the first paperless budget of independent India. She took a digital tablet which was wrapped in a bahi khata styled pouch and it was considered as a move to strengthen the movement of digital India in our country. Now, as the established tradition, finance minister first meets the president and asks for the assent of the president and the Rashtrapati Bhavan before leaving for the parliament for the presentation of the budget. Also, a meeting of the union cabinet is also held at 10 a.m. in the morning on 1st of February and after getting nod from the cabinet, finance minister then presents the budget in the parliament. Now, since we have in-depth understanding of the annual financial statement or the union budget of India, let us try to analyze the union budget of 2024-2025. Now, first thing which we need to understand is that this particular budget is built on the roadmap of Viksit Bharat that has developed India by the year 2047. And primarily, this budget will be focusing on four major castes, that is women, youth, poor and farmers. And this was also highlighted in the speech of the Union Finance Minister as well. And also, the budget theme is under four different categories. That is employment, skilling, MSMEs and middle class as well. Also, this particular budget has highlighted nine key priority areas which our country would be focusing in the next one year and where the major outlay of the government would be. The first priority area is the productivity and resilience in the agriculture sector. So, agriculture sector is the first priority area. Second is the employment and skilling. Third is the inclusive and human resource development, which also involves social justice. Fourth is manufacturing and service sector. Fifth is the urban development. Sixth is energy security. Seventh is the focus on infrastructure development. Eighth is the focus on innovation, research and development in the country. And last but not the least is the focus on next generation reform for our country. All these key priority areas combined together will lead to our country becoming developed by the year 2047. And that is what our budget 
it also entails and focuses on. Now, in all these key priority areas, there have been several new initiatives which have been announced by the government of India. If we talk about the first priority area, that is agriculture sector. In the agriculture sector, the government would primarily be focusing on transforming agricultural research, transforming research and development in the agriculture sector, and also focusing on vegetable production and the supply chain management in this particular sector. Also additional to this, close to 109 high yielding variety of climate resilient varieties of 32 horticulture crops will be released for the cultivation of the farmers and also 1 crore farmers would be initiated into natural farming in our country. Now natural farming as you know is very climate friendly and is also very much important for climate goals which our country has set. Now government is coming with a new centrally sponsored scheme for skilling the youth of our country. If you remember we are already having Skill India program working in our country. Additional to this a new initiative would be coming up with the motive of skilling 20 lakh youths in our country in the next 5 years and also close to 1000 industrial training institutes will be revamped and remade. Also, the course content and the design and the curriculum of the courses will also be changed suiting the industry demands. Also, a new scheme for the internship in top 500 companies for 1 crore youth in our country will also be launched. So, it is basically a new internship scheme for the youth of our country which will be sponsored by the government. And additional to this, three more schemes in relation to those who are joining the job for the first time, second scheme for the job creation in the manufacturing sector and third scheme to support the employers would also be launched in the coming year. Now coming to the third priority area in relation to inclusive human resource development and social justice. Now to ensure this, government has come up with the concept of Purvodya, that is Vikas Bhi, Virasad Bhi. It is basically a plan for endowment rich areas in our country to generate economic growth to attain Viksit Bharat by 2047 and allocation of close to 3 lakh crores for women and children in our country would also promote social justice in our country in a holistic way and also for the northeastern region in our country to boost financial inclusion in the region and to boost connectivity close to 100 Indian post payment banks will be constructed or will be made. Now, in relation to the manufacturing and services as well, credit guarantee scheme for MSMEs will be announced. New assessment model for MSME credit will be announced. Mudra loans limit has been enhanced to 20 lakh from the current 10 lakh rupees. And also, several other opportunities in relation to internship has also been promoted to ensure manufacturing and the service sector of our country becomes robust. Now, in relation to the urban development, there have been changes made in the stamp duty. And the government of India has encouraged the states to lower stamp duty for the properties purchased by women. Also, the government of India is envisioning a scheme to develop 100 weekly huts and street food hubs in the select cities. Also, there have been changes made in relation to transit-oriented development, water management and Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban 2.0 as well. Now, in relation to energy security as well, there have been several initiatives with private sector and nuclear energy as well. Whether it be Bharat Small Reactors or whether it be promotion of R&D of the Bharat Small Modular Reactor and newer technologies for the nuclear energy as well pumped up storage policies there, then AUSC thermal power plants and energy audit and PM Surya Ghar Muft Bijli Yojana has been envisaged in this particular budget. Now in relation to the infrastructure sector, close to 11.11 .11 lakh crores, that is 3.4% of the GDP has been provisioned by the government of India. Also several initiatives to promote irrigation and flood mitigation and tourism in our country have also been introduced in the budget of 2024. In relation to the innovation, research and development as well, there have been operations Operationalization of Anusandhan National Research Fund for basic research and prototype development as well. And also, the private sector driven approach and innovation has been there in the union budget as well. And in relation to the next generation reforms, rural and urban land related reforms have been initiated by the government of India. It might include the unique land parcel identification number or Bhu Aadhaar for all the lands and several other land record measures and land reform measures as well. Also, the provision of NPS Vatsalya, a plan for the contribution by the parents and guardians for the minor or whether it be the changes in the new pension scheme, all the things have been initiated in the budget of 2024. Now, since we have understood that what all measures the government has taken in relation to all the nine key priority areas, one more thing which I'd like to add here is, now if you want to understand all these initiatives of nine key priority areas in bit more detail, we have attached a PDF in the description section of this particular video. You can use the PDF and understand more about the budget 2024. And now since we have understood all these things, let us try to make sense of different statistics which are mentioned in the budget of 2024 and let us try to analyze those statistics as well. 
Now, as you would remember, initially I told you there are two parts of the budget. One is the capital budget, and one is the revenue budget. Now, revenue budget and the capital budget basically are having two components again. That is expenditure component and receipts component. So, let us start one by one. Let us look at the expenditure first, and then we will look at the receipts. So, the budget expenditure for the year 2024-2025 is close to 48.2 lakh crores, which is basically 8.5% higher than that of previous year. Out of this 48.2 lakh crores, 37.1 lakh crore is the revenue expenditure, which again means the routine expenditure which is done on the day-to-day -day workings of the government, which includes salaries, pensions or any other expenditure of the government which is of day-to-day -day activity. And additional 11.11 .11 lakh crores is the capital expenditure of the government of India, which we also call as CAPEX. That is money spent by the government of India on creation of various assets. For example, building dams, roadways, railways, ports, buildings and several other asset classes as well. Now, if we see the budget allocation to different ministries, that is the expenditure incurred on different ministries, the defence ministry gets close to 6.2 lakh crores. The road, transport and highway ministry, it got close to 2.78 lakh crores. Railway ministry got close to 2.55 lakh crores. And few other important ministries like agriculture and farmer welfare got allocated 1.32 lakh crores. Or the Ministry of Education was allocated 1.2 lakh crores. And Ministry of Health and Family Welfare got close to 90,900 and 59 crores. Now, all these data sets at an approximate value are important for us to understand and to know as well. And also one very interesting thing to note here is that the interest payments account for close to 24% of the total expenditure of the government of India. Now, since we have understood the total expenditure, that is the budget expenditure, let us move towards budget receipts, that is the money which the government receives. Now, what you have to understand here is that all these datas are the projected expenditure and the projected receipts of the government of India for the coming financial year, that is the financial year of 2024 and 2025. So, all these datas are projected. After that, there will be datas released for the actual classification. Now, in the next year, the actual data, the actual receipts and the actual expenditure data will also be released by the government of India. All these datas which we are studying right now are the projected datas. The total receipts of the government of India expected in this financial financial year is close to 32.07 lakh crores, which is 15% more than the last year. And out of this 32.07 lakh crores, close to 31.29 lakh crores is the revenue receipts. That means it includes tax revenues like income tax, corporation tax, indirect tax and several other taxes as well. And close to 78,000 crores is in the form of capital receipts, that is in relation to changes in assets and liabilities of the government. Now, first of all, let us see the taxation part separately. The gross tax revenue of the government is projected to be close to 38.4 lakh crores. So, 10.2 lakh crores out of this whole amount would be received by the government of India in the form of corporation tax. Close to 11.87 lakh crores would be received by the government in relation to the taxes on income, that is income tax. And close to 10.6 lakh crores is the expected revenue out of the goods and services tax for the government of India. And additional to this, the revenue from the customs and the excise duties will also be there. Now, if we see very closely, we understood that 48.2 lakh crores will be the total expenditure, that is the total budget expenditure, and 32.07 lakh crores will be the total receipts of the government, that is the budget receipts of the government. Now, what we can see clearly and what we can observe clearly here is that the expenditure of the government of India is higher, a lot, lot higher than that of the receipts of the government of India. That means the money which the government of India would be spending is much higher than what the government of India would be receiving which clearly shows and which clearly means that government of India needs to borrow the additional money for meeting its expenditure. And that borrowed money is what we call as fiscal deficit. So the difference between 48.2 lakh crores and 32.07 lakh crores is close to 16.13 lakh crores. And this 16.13 lakh crores becomes the total borrowings which the government has to make in order to ensure that they meet its expenditure. And this 16.13 lakh crores will be the fiscal deficit of our country. Now, in simple terms, fiscal deficit basically refers to the excess of expenditure in relation to the receipts of the government. So, it is the amount by which the government's expenditure exceeds the government's receipts in a particular fiscal year or a particular financial year. And it indicates the 
total borrowings which the government has to make. Now you must have heard of a very famous act that is Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act of 2003 that is FRBM Act of 2003. Now it requires the government of India to progressively reduce its fiscal deficit levels and it is having certain targets which the government of India has to achieve in the coming few years in order to contain its fiscal deficit. The estimated fiscal deficit for the year 2024-2025 would be close to 4.9% of the GDP. Now whereas the actual fiscal deficit for the last year was close to 5.6% of the GDP. Also if you remember in the year 2021 the fiscal deficit of our country was close to 9.2% and now since it is 4.9% for the projected next year we have come a long way and we have improved our fiscal deficit position because of fiscal consolidation and fiscal prudence in our country and if we continue doing this the government of india will reach the frbm target of 3% fiscal deficit by the year 2028 now also additional to the fiscal deficit the projected revenue deficit would be 1.8% and the projected primary deficit would be close to 1.4% of the gdp now the revenue deficit is very simple it is basically the amount to which revenue expenditure exceeds the revenue receipts however primary deficit basically involves fiscal deficit minus the interest payments so in reality it basically shows the government's total borrowing excluding the interest payments or excluding the interests now all these datas if we see very objectively they are very very important for our understanding for our examination and for our analytical perspective as well now if we see the reforms of taxation In relation to taxation several reforms have also been initiated by the government in this union budget 2024. First change is in relation to the income tax rate slabs. Now in your screen you will be seeing the new regime for the income tax slabs in our country which have been introduced by this particular budget. Now additional to this the finance minister has announced a comprehensive review of the income tax act of 1961 to make it more clear, concise, easy to read and efficient. The aim is to reduce disputes, reduce litigations and to ensure tax certainty for the taxpayers which is very very important for a country which is aiming to become developed by the year 2047 the government has also introduced vivad se vishwas scheme 2024 for resolution of income tax disputes and pending appeals which are ongoing and also one more critical change because of which the government has been criticized from several quarters is the change in the short term and long term capital gains tax now first of all let us try to understand what is this capital gains term so capital gains is basically a economic concept which deals with the profit earned of the sale of an asset over a period of time when its value has increased now these capital gains can either be short term or can be long term depending on the holding period and there are several classifications to it as well based on different asset classes in the budget of 2024 the tax on long term capital gains has been increased from 10% which was earlier present to 12.5% so the long term capital gains tax will now be 12.5% also short term capital gains tax has been increased from 15% to 20% so now the short term capital gains tax will be 20% of the capital gains now this move has been criticized from several quarters from the different business groups from the stock market experts and from common people as well complaining that this might reduce the investors confidence and might demotivate the investors to invest in capital assets now shravan shetty who's md at primus partners has said that increase in the long term capital gains tax might lead to investments moving to unproductive assets like gold or real estates also stock market has also reacted very negatively to these changes both sensex and nifty indices show a significant drop on the day budget 2024 was announced now comprehensively understanding the capital gains short term and long term capital gains tax would require a separate session of its own so do let me know in the comment section that should we have a separate session for capital gains and short term and long term capital gains tax or not now additional to this there was one more crucial change which was made that was the abolition of angel tax now this step has been appreciated from a lot of quarters especially from the startup community of our country now the major aim of the government to take this step is to bolster the startup ecosystem in our country now let us understand what is this angel tax angel tax is basically the tax imposed by the government on funding received by the unlisted companies or the startups now if the investment received by the startup is greater than the fair market value then the angel tax comes into play 
and it was levied at a hefty rate of 30% and has now been abolished. Also, the corporate tax for the foreign companies has been reduced from 40% to 35%, again, which is an appreciable move. Now, one more change because of which the budget has been criticized a lot is the increase in the securities transaction tax by the government of India. So, security transaction tax is the tax payable on the securities transacted in a recognized stock exchange in our country. So security transaction tax on futures have been increased to 0.02% and on options, it has been increased to 0.1%. Now, Ashneer Grover, the founder and ex-managing director of Bharat Pay, has said that this budget lacks the spine and juice to bolster our economic growth to 13 or 14% a year. He also remarked that if the budget was not announced at all, still India is having the ability to grow at a 6 to 7% growth rate every year. Year. Budget, uh, of the new government, right? So it's the first out of the five years. And uh, what your expectation is that you will take some strong decisions in the in the first one because that gives you the political leeway in some sense. From a 7% GDP which we can achieve without any budget being announced to an actual 12-15% uh, GDP growth. Hence, the budget's role is to amplify things and to take the 6-7% growth rate to 13-14% growth rate a year. This is what he had to say. Now, many experts believe that government's action or the government's step of taxing more, spending more and borrowing more is not a very good step. Experts suggest that more money should be left at the disposal of the private businesses so that they can create more jobs. Either they could spend the money for consumption or they could spend the money for investments. In both of the cases, jobs Job creation will tremendously increase and if private players are having more investable surplus with them, definitely they will invest the surplus in the whole economy and eventually economic growth will propel. Ashneer Grover also suggested a single tax rate in relation to income tax for our country and suggested that there should be 20% tax rate for any income earned above the tune of 10 lakh rupees per annum. He said that removal of income tax slab would make the system more effective and more efficient because these multiple income tax slabs are not doing any good good to the people of our country and to the government exchequer as well. It is just complicating the process and also benefiting the chartered accountants who are charging hefty amounts of money or hefty fees for filing the income tax returns of the common people. He also suggested that the distinction of short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains should be removed altogether and 10% capital gains tax should have been imposed on all types of capital gains to again make the system more effective and more simpler. Now, many experts were also expecting several overhaul reforms in relation to goods and services tax in our country. But no such reforms were announced or introduced in this particular budget. And a single uniform tax rate or indirect tax rate for the whole country still remains a distant dream. Also, several academicians and experts have pointed out that this increase in the capital gains tax in our country would be drastically impacting our country in a negative way. Because there are many other countries like Singapore, Dubai or many other tax havens which are having essentially 0% or very very low capital gains tax. So it might lead to outflow of capital from our country to these tax havens. Now we have to understand that many people, including high net worth individuals, they focus a lot on a return on their taxes. And if the return on their taxes is negative or negligible, then they would be wanting to migrate to other countries. For example, again, Ireland, Dubai, Singapore, Mauritius, Cayman Islands, and several other tax havens as well. We have covered this phenomena in detail in a separate video. You can go through it for your better understanding. Now, as always, definitely there are two sides of the coin. So if there are criticisms and concerns, there are positive aspects and praises to this budget as well. Now, Kumar Manglam Birla, who is the chairman of Aditya Birla Group, has praised the budget 2024 for its clear intent and the focus of the government on long-term growth of our country and also building the foundations for a developed India by 2047. Nirmal Jain, who is the founder of IIFL Group, have also praised the budget of 2024 and said that it involves a well-rounded strategy to foster inclusive growth, economic stability and improving overall quality of life for the public of our country. Now, do let us know in the comment section that what are your views on the budget 2024 and what would be more reforms which could have been introduced in the budget to make it more effective and efficient for our country. Also, we have added certain practice questions at the end of this video. Do solve them and write the correct answers in the comment section. I hope you gained a new perspective and understanding from this video. All the very best and have a nice day.